The lands of the extreme north were characteristically free. Slavery died out in the two centuries following Christianization and the containment of Viking raiding. Serfdom was also almost unknown. Partly this was due to the enduring ethos of clan freedom, with the understanding that the clans were composed of free farmers, heirs, as it were, of the great Viking warrior bands. Partly, too, it was due to the absence of the kinds of settlement that might otherwise have made it viable. Scandinavia was dotted with hamlets and individual farmsteads rather than villages. Finally, the low density of population and the ease with which a threatened population could escape to the nearby snowy and forested wilderness undermined attempts to subjugate the population. Only in densely populated continental Denmark in the early 14th century, when it suffered a decades-long agrarian crisis, do we see the emergence of a dependent peasantry. Yet the Scandinavian lands were not oases of equality. There were strong warrior and service aristocracies and a strong church. From the point of view of the Scandinavian kings, the aristocracies were a problem because they claimed some power over the royal succession, sometimes the right to elect. They also expected to be partners in government. The fundamental problem was the absence of any secure principles of succession beyond election. This meant that every king, whether in Norway, Sweden, or Denmark, who wanted to nominate his successor, use anticipatory succession, or establish the principle of primogenitary succession had to confront rival claimants from within the royal family who were willing to call upon aristocratic support from various factions. To this extent, the church was all the more important for royal rule. Time worked to the advantage of churches, which had still been very weak in the 12th century. Sweden, of course, had offered the most outright resistance to Christianization because of the symbolic and spiritual importance of the pagan shrine at Uppsala, the prestige its aristocratic protectors enjoyed, and the profits they shared, which were derived from the shrine and the commerce that took place within its peace. It took decades after the formal acceptance of Christianity by the Swedish monarchy to undermine the power of these aristocrats, and how it was done is still not clear, given the thinness of the sources. One argument sees the growing commercial relations with Christian merchants, who, even if they did not refuse to trade with pagans whom they suspected of practicing human sacrifice, preferred to deal with Christians. By the late 12th century and throughout the 13th century, the church in Scandinavia worked hand in glove with the kings to secure royal rule and establish the kind of peace that would allow ecclesiastical institutions to flourish. Where a combination of ecclesiastical leadership and exceptional rulership obtained, the possibilities for economic growth, territorial expansion, and internal stability were excellent. This was certainly the case in Norway and Denmark, less so in Sweden. The Norwegian case is noteworthy. After a series of brief reigns at the turn of the 12th, 13th century, Norway had only three kings for most of the century. Haakon IV, Magnus VI Lawmender, and Haakon V. Dynastic stability was a sine qua non for getting aristocrats to see that it was to their advantage to hitch their destiny to that of the crown. Many of the most formidable heads of families became associated with the itinerant royal court, which in its travels made a terrific symbol of the power of the crown. At the same time, with the support of the church, which began to accumulate considerable property and popular loyalty, the monarchs created an elaborate regional administration for the country comprising regulatory, judicial, and fiscal districts under the control of approximately 70 key appointees. Local assemblies, things, remained intact, but were co-opted in an administrative partnership. In this sense, the crown was not dependent on the aristocracy for governance. As Magnus V.I.'s epithet, Law Minder implies, many of the ordinances and decrees that articulated the rules of this system and the relation of its parts to one another and to the governed were the work of that king and his advisors. The consequences of a strong administration and a harnessed nobility were widespread advantages in diplomatic and commercial relations. Norway maintained its hold, jurisdictionally speaking, over Iceland and the North Sea Islands. Norwegian stockfish was exported throughout the Baltic region. Bergen, the biggest town, which at its height may have reached 10,000 in population, though this seems a bit exaggerated, emerged as a major entrepot on the western coast. It also became a sort of royal capital for Norway. The court remained itinerant, but there was a tendency for it to visit Bergen often and to stay resident for relatively extended periods. As southern coastal Norway became more active in trade, however, 
Oslo arose as a rival center of Norwegian administration. In the 1160s, we first hear about the loose Baltic and North Sea Association of Merchants and Merchant Towns, known as the Hansa. Bergen was to become an important contact point and trading settlement for Hansa merchants. Even so, the Norwegian kingdom's relations with the association were not always good. Leadership of the Hansa rested with the continental German town of Lübeck. It was the soul of Hanseatic self-esteem and was a particular thorn in the side of the Norwegian kings. They tried several times to get control of Lübeck by diplomacy and by force, so as to protect the kingdom from punitive boycotts of grain orchestrated under the town's leadership. The Lübecker's position was to oppose all measures that were intended to regulate Hansa merchants or to diminish their privileges. Embargoing shipments of grain was one way Lübeckers resisted. Since most of the carrying trade was in non-Norwegian hands, embargo was a very effective way to put pressure on the kingdom. Norway's neighbor, Denmark, entered the 13th century much as Norway had, with a legacy of disorder finally being overcome. The Danes had endured terrible civil wars in the 12th century, but their country's recovery was astounding, thanks largely to a series of archbishops of Lund, warrior prelates, who used all their influence and power to work with the crown to establish an environment suitable for the expansion of Christianity. This was not only a domestic imperative. In the 12th century pagans lived on the continental borders of Denmark. Danes and Germans, sometimes in concert, sometimes not, carried on an enterprise of conquest and conversion. Eventually, the Danes created a mini-empire in the Baltic extending as far as Estonia, which they conquered in 1219 and then partially pacified in a series of campaigns justified with a decidedly crusade ideology. Part of the Danes' success can be imputed to the German emperor's relative lack of concern with matters along the Baltic. It also has much to do with the state of civil unrest in Germany, where the strife over succession in the early part of the 13th century and the bitter struggle with the papacy later on made the emperor willing to buy Danish support, or at least Danish neutrality by key concessions, including territorial ones. This was not, however, the attitude of Baltic German aristocrats who did not want to come under an authoritarian form of Danish rulership. It was they who led the resistance. The well-governed Danish kingdom of the early 13th century the kingdom that could conquer a major stretch of territory in the eastern Baltic and was so well administered that the decrees of the Fourth Lateran Council, including that on ordeals, were enforced quickly and smoothly, was almost in disarray by 1240. German aristocrats came to exercise more and more power in German lands claimed by the Danish kings and in Denmark itself, where they made incursions, by violence and by marriage alliances. Increasingly, they ignored or bypassed royal authority. In the event, the Danish aristocracy saw its chance to escape the authoritarian rule of the kings. As in England, they exacted a great charter of liberties, the Handfestning of 1282, which effectively constrained the king's arbitrary powers and confirmed the importance of the Danehof, an institution similar to the English Parliament, as the forum for articulating policy. The least successful royal experience was in Sweden. To be sure, Sweden was expanding territorially throughout the years of royal weakness, in a pattern similar to Germany's. Towns, island merchant communities, like that at Visby on Gotland, and aristocrats led the way in quasi-crusades with mercantile overtones into southern Finland and, with less success, into Rus. The church, too, managed to deepen its roots in local society, encourage gifts to itself, and articulated the rationale for expansion and internal colonization by an innovative series of building campaigns, including the construction of good forest roads. But little or none of this saved the monarchy from the debilitating succession struggles of the first half of the 13th century. Not until the regency established by Jarl Berger in 1248 was there some hope for stability. In a coup d'etat, he established his 12-year-old son on the throne as Valdemar I in 1250 and imposed what can only be described as a ruthless regime, suppressing dissent by the free use of capital punishment and the levying of heavy, nearly confiscatory taxes. After Berger's death in 1266, Valdemar ruled alone until deposed in 1275 by his brother and successor Magnus I Lagellus, in circumstances that can at best be described as grotesque. Valdemar became enamored of his wife's sister and fathered a child by her. Not only was his liaison with his sister-in-law incestuous by contemporary moral and canon law standards, 
The sister-in-law was also a postulant, the female equivalent of a monastic novice. That is to say, although she was not a fully vowed nun, she was already a daughter of the church and under its protection. Valdemar went on pilgrimage to Rome to seek papal absolution for his sins. In the hothouse environment of Rome, and with the deep stain of incest upon him, Valdemar succumbed to the Pope's price for reconciliation. Sweden had been, as we have seen, one of the slowest countries to destroy paganism. Sweden and Norway were notoriously slow as well in accepting the reforms associated with the Church's victory over lay investiture, such as the celibacy of the clergy, and unlike Denmark, had not been particularly swift to enforce the decrees of the Fourth Lateran Council or, for that matter, of the First Council of Lyons, which had furthered the reform of the Church. Now, in the year 1274, the year of the Second Council of Lyons, Pope Gregory X saw an opportunity to strengthen papal leadership of the Church in Sweden. As Innocent III had done with John of England early in the century, Gregory obliged Valdemar to accept papal overlordship of his kingdom and to promise to render annual taxes to Rome as a token. In Sweden, the news was greeted with derision. Moreover, the resentments incurred in the mid-century during the autocratic rule of Jarl Berger culminated in a coalition of barons seizing power, replacing Valdemar and elevating his brother, Magnus I. Valdemar fought hard to regain the throne, but was defeated in battle and fled to Norway, carrying on his efforts by intrigue and feint until his death in 1302. Magnus succeeded beyond expectations in establishing a stable rule, despite his brother's wearisome machinations. To do so, he had to heed the advice of select nobles, co-opt them, as it were. It is usually said that the mature form of the royal council, the institution within which this co-optation took place, dates from his reign. He was also responsible for improving administration and governance, no doubt in part under the influence of similar developments in Norway. The quality of his work in this regard is indicated by his epithet, Lagilas, which means barnlock. Farmers felt safe from depredations in the best days of his reign. Unfortunately for the groups that benefited from his rule, his work was jeopardized at his death when he left a ten-year-old as his successor. The problems of the early 14th century which were to ensue crippled the Swedish monarchy as badly as those which Jarl Berger had temporarily overcome. The phrase during Nock Austin or thrust to the east, is the name traditionally given to the movement of Germans and other Westerners into Central and Eastern Europe in the High Middle Ages. Thrust, or even an alternate translation like push, does tend to emphasize the violent aspect of a movement that was only intermittently violent. It began by and large with Catholic missionary activity to pagan Baltic and Slavic peoples, and some of this missionary activity was very peaceful. Yet the indigenous peoples, as members of heroic societies that valued conspicuous displays of wealth, were sometimes unimpressed by the public face of humility that the early missionaries bore. Consequently, the missionaries began to adopt practices more likely to attract converts, especially from among the rulers, including ostentatious displays of the wealth of the society from which they came. The new practices did attract some converts, and also some envy. Linguistic barriers aggravated the dissonance of the encounter between Christian and pagan, and the situation was further complicated by the fact that some of the already Christianized Slavic allies of the German missionaries had little love for the pagans who had been their traditional rivals. Moreover, missionary activity went hand in hand with trade, then settlement, first temporary, later permanent. Self-defense on both sides, when violent disputes broke out, exacerbated a situation that became increasingly fractious. When, in the 12th century, crusade ideology intruded into this mix from the Christian side, and when displacement of the indigenous population accompanied permanent settlement, as it did fairly frequently, the Drang Nok Austin took on the form of recurrent and destructive warfare. The principalities created in the wake of this warfare in the 13th century came to be known collectively as military states or order states. The term Order State stems from the prominence of the Order of the Teutonic Knights and the Order of the Sword Brothers, two ecclesiastical associations of monk knights that took over the governance of large territories in Baltic Europe with the conquest of Livonia and Prussia. This was possible in part because of the erosion of Danish and Polish power along the Baltic, despite the successes of these kingdoms earlier on. The imposing symbols of the military order's dominance were the great brick and mortar castles that they erected.
These odd debates, who at the time of the conquest had not yet mastered the art of making bricks or mortar. Of course, the orders did not manage to create an order state everywhere. The Teutonic Knights, encouraged by King Andrew of Hungary to establish houses in Transylvania from 1211, tried to establish a principality but were expelled forcibly by Andrew for the attempt in 1225. The Hospitallers helped to colonize Slavic villages with Germans in the Czech lands, Silesia and Pomerania at roughly the same time. They were not expelled because they did not try to achieve territorial governance. It is a commonplace that the Drang Nok Austin, in its most aggressive and successful military and commercial phases, was the work of princes and towns, ecclesiastics and merchants. Yet the emperors were never completely uninterested in eastern developments. They could at times bring their considerable influence to bear to settle disputes among contending parties. They were particularly concerned when military campaigns in the Baltic East threatened to bring retaliation on the empire from potentially powerful foreign forces, like Poland or the principalities of Rus. But eastern Baltic problems paled in comparison with those with the Italian communes and the papacy. This was certainly the case for Pope Innocent III's ward, Frederick II, Hohenstaufen King of Sicily from 1198 and, from 1220, also Holy Roman Emperor, Frederick would come to occupy a unique position in the medieval and modern European imagination as the Stupermundi, the wonder of the world. His intellectual interests were wide-ranging. Falconology, natural science, political theory. But he had to satisfy his personal interests, as had most other emperors, in the brief intervals between dealing with the seemingly intractable problems of governance in Italy. The emperor's power base should have been Germany, but Germany itself was decentralized as a result, in part, of Frederick Barbarossa's political reforms in the 12th century. It became more divided still during Frederick II's rule because of new disputes with the papacy. When Pope Innocent III died in 1216, it was left to Frederick II to settle by force contesting claims to the German royal title with Otto of Brunswick. His success in doing so had another aspect. Future popes were unhappy with the reality of a German king emperor who was also king of Sicily. They felt territorial pressure on the papal states from both north and south and looked upon every evidence of Frederick's disagreement with papal policy or outright defiance of it as a threat to the liberty of the church and, therefore, as testimony to the emperor's spiritual corruption. A brood of vipers would be the phrase that papal publicists would ultimately use to describe Frederick and his lineage. Frederick tried to offer himself as a crusader to help deflect papal censure, but even on this matter it was difficult for him to persuade churchmen and many nobles of his good intentions. He repeatedly postponed fulfilling his vow, and when he finally did so, it was done in a way that antagonized many of the most important leaders in Europe and the Holy Land. In 1229, after denouncing the strategy and tactics of crusaders who were in the field before him, he succeeded in negotiating Jerusalem's return to Christian hands. In so doing, he had to make concessions to the Muslims with regard to access to holy sites and agree to limit future fortifications. This was certainly the case for Pope Innocent III's ward, Frederick II. Hohenstaufen King of Sicily from 1198 and, from 1220, also Holy Roman Emperor, Frederick would come to occupy a unique position in the medieval and modern European imagination as the Stupermundi, the wonder of the world. His intellectual interests were wide-ranging. Falconology, natural science, political theory. But he had to satisfy his personal interests, as had most other emperors in the brief intervals between dealing with the seemingly intractable problems of governance in Italy. The emperor's power base should have been Germany, but Germany itself was decentralized as a result, in part, of Frederick Barbarossa's political reforms in the 12th century. It became more divided still during Frederick II's rule because of new disputes with the papacy. When Pope Innocent III died in 1216, it was left to Frederick II to settle by force contesting claims to the German royal title with Otto of Brunswick. His success in doing so had another aspect. Future popes were unhappy with the reality of a German king emperor who was also king of Sicily. They felt territorial pressure on the papal states from both north and south and looked upon every evidence of Frederick's disagreement with papal policy or outright defiance of it as a threat to the liberty of the church and, therefore, as testimony to the emperor's spiritual corruption. A brood of vipers would be the phrase that papal publicists would ultimately use to describe Frederick and his lineage.
Frederick tried to offer himself as a crusader to help deflect papal censure, but even on this matter it was difficult for him to persuade churchmen and many nobles of his good intentions. He repeatedly postponed fulfilling his vow, and when he finally did so, it was done in a way that antagonized many of the most important leaders in Europe and the Holy Land. In 1229, after denouncing the strategy and tactics of crusaders who were in the field before him, he succeeded in negotiating Jerusalem's return to Christian hands. In so doing, he had to make concessions to the Muslims with regard to access to holy sites and agree to limit future fortifications. 